and fabulous. So today's session is all about the harmonics and the Hornivians and how we can use them in coaching or how we can ignore them in coaching as well. Uh, as with all things inside the Enneagram, we are invited to hold the theory lightly and to work with the humans in front of us. Um, so let us keep that front and center as we delve into the topic. Then also just a quick announcement and maybe there's one or two other announcements from the community as well. Our next supervision is a public supervision with Julia and it is on the 8th of March um, and it's on Steve Biko's um, work and what it has to say about entitlement. So anyone that's interested in that, so more of a, in keeping with 2022, we will be um, doing public supervisions that are more existential for one session and the second session in the month will be more uh, theory focused and I lead the second session and Julia leads the more public supervision. So just so that we get into the new rhythm of this. Anyone else who's doing any interesting work um, or any interesting workshops coming up that you want to announce quickly, you can just unmute yourself so the community knows what's up. Um, anything else that's happening? I'm Ingrid? doing a gazillion things. I've got a free seminar on the second in the evening, which is about Enneagram in corporates. I think you've seen the invite, hey, Lucille, on the group. Um, I'm not 100% sure I'll be able to make it, but Mario Sakura said he wants to be there. So it's going to be quite an informal chat about um, the Enneagram in corporates. So if you want to come to that, I can add you to the invite list. Are you happy for me to put my email address in the thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you haven't met Mario yet, he's a fantastic Philadelphian Enneagram 8 who successfully raised four boys. And I absolutely look up to him for that alone, given that my two teenagers are a work in progress. Um, and I can, highly recommend, I can highly recommend him. Hopefully, he'll get to be there as well. Anyone yeah. else? Any other courses? I've um, got a ton. I've, I'm just going to put my website in the email yeah. address in the chat so people can go and look. The one Perfect. on Roma is starting soon. The, um, there's a childhood patterns one starting on the 7th. So, yeah, just go take a look or email me. Brilliant. Chris, do. Yes, we spoke about it this morning, uh, Lucille, and it's just a testing of the water. So if, if anyone is interested in reading a novel with me, uh, I, I have read this amazing Norwegian novel, um, not in Norwegian, of course, in English, by a novelist with, with the name Kyle Frode Tiller. The novel's name is Encircling. It's actually a trilogy. Uh, and uh, it is an amazing, amazing exploration of the dynamics between people and internally in people and the way in which identity is constructed by the, by the narrator, the, the novelist himself, by the various perspectives on the main character in the novel, and of course the the people, the various people who are constructing the narratives around the main character. And, and I thought while I was reading it, um, I was thinking a lot about the Enneagram and thought that, that it might be interesting to read this with an Enneagram group. People who know the Enneagram uh, in a sort of an exploratory fashion and for as long as we want to. I mean, I've read the whole thing. I just couldn't stop reading it. Um, but it's long. It's, uh, it's three novels, so it's more than a thousand pages, the whole thing. Um, so if you are interested in reading a novel, I mean, we have reading groups, and we, usually we read theory and technique and that kind of thing. So this is a completely different uh, approach. It's actually reading a novel. And personally, I feel that... But if you want to understand something about human, human beings, novels are a really good place to go. Mm. Perfect. And so maybe, Christy, if you can also just pop your email in the chat and we can, individuals who want to read a novel, novel with an Enneagram lens by an interesting Norwegian author, 
uh, you can join us. Um, Christian, I will be there. Just checking, Helena, you're unmuted. Do you also have a course you want to announce? Okay, anyone else with a course coming up? Perfect, yes. We Helena. have the Love Legacy Dignity course beginning on the 8th of March. So it competes with this time, I'm afraid, but it's um, four sessions from four to 6.30. So if anyone wants to think about how they're living when, with a readiness to die, because you don't know when that's going to happen, then those four workshops are for you. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Helena. Please pop it in the chat, uh, just your email address if people want to reach out for that. Great. So are we good to go in terms of our content for today? And so uh, how the session is going to be structured, we're going to do just a more general check-in, which will be incredibly helpful for me around setting topics for the rest of the year, um, which we'll do in pairs and just report back on via the chat box. Um, so that's the first thing. And then we're going to look at a bit of harmonic and Hornevian theory, and we'll apply it into some case studies and into your case studies that you want to bring into the group as well towards the end. So, um, and I'm happy to make the presentation um, that we're using here available to everyone. So let me just quickly go into a different mode of screen sharing. Just give me a sec um, for our check-in questions. Da, da, da. I think it will go here. No, it's not doing it properly. Sorry, try again. There we go. So um, in your small group check-in, you're just going to take 10 minutes to discuss what's one of your biggest learnings from for yourself or for your clients that you had in the last year in terms of working with the Enneagram. So something that really landed for you in the last year. Maybe it's more than one thing. Uh, but then the second question, really important here, is what are you interested in learning more about or integrating into your practice in 2022 with regards to the Enneagram? And uh, that we're going to ask you to just report back on via the chat box when you come back. So what did you learn last year that you want to share in this group with regards to yourself and all your clients in the Enneagram? And what do you want more of in this year? And then, and whatever you want to say in the check-in to each other as well. I'll just do some random groups for us. And um, let's just do how many people are we? Okay. Um, wonderful. So there we go. There's some groups and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, and so the harmonics and the Hornevians. Um, so first off to say, there are many triads inside the Enneagram. Here's just some of them. Um, most of us know the centers, the body, the heart, and the head center fairly well. Um, some of you have been exploring and have also popped in the chat box wanting to learn more about object relations. Ingrid does a wonderful course on that as well. And so that's been interesting learning for many of us in the last year. Um, but then two of the groups that have been, the triads that have been hanging around for quite a while in different ways inside the Enneagram community, the Hornevians and the Harmonics. Um, and we'll deal with these discreetly and then we'll kind of pop it all into a couple of profiles and see what comes from that. So let's deal with the Hornevians first. Um, so the Hornevians come, the, the Hornevians are based on the work of Karen Horne, who was a psychoanalyst, a like kind of post-Freudian psychoanalyst in most of her work um, in the 50s, 60s, also started feminist um, psychoanalytic theory in response to um, some of uh, Freud's ideas around penis envy. She said us women need to join the party in interesting ways um, and started the feminist uh, psychoanalytic movement in the 50s. But Cor Karen Horne's work um, initially mapped 10 different 
10 different social stances that are the basis of neurosis. Yeah? And these then were grouped over time into three groupings that have been imported into the Enneagram. Now, the first thing that we have to say around this is not all Enneagram teachers agree wholeheartedly that the groupings are as well presented now. Um, Jerry Wagner says that actually, you know, sevens might actually be compliant and ones might actually be assertive, but we'll, so just know that we don't all agree on it, uh, but it does look pretty neat in the triangles we'll be working with um, today. Now, what are the Hornevians as we know them, as we've imported them into the Enneagram? One of the common ways in which we talk about them is to say that they are social stances. Um, but just thinking of them as a, a social stance might not be enough because we can get waylaid into thinking, for example, that Lucille is incredibly assertive, but her uh, social stance is apparently withdrawn. So how, how do we then build on it? And so um, if we build on a social stance and we say maybe the Hornevians are actually about ways we try and get what we want, and if we bring this together, maybe the Hornevians have to do with how I interact with others to get what I want. So it's a social stance in service of my needs in some kind of way. Now, in the Hornevians, um, as they most popularly mapped, we have three groupings. Seven, eight, and three um, are generally referred to as the assertive triad. One, two, and six as the compliant triad and nine, four, and five as the withdrawn triad, yeah? So that's, that's the core way in which they are um, expressed. The variation on the theme is Jerry's position is that seven actually belongs in compliant and one actually belongs in assertive. So just hold that lightly, who knows? Who knows how this all works? So um, from that perspective, uh, a couple of things we can say about the Hornevians. So um, I've used in the, in, the, in the second line of the, the kind of heading table is what Karen Horne's words were for this. So she didn't use the word the assertive um, stances. She said the expansive or aggressive stances. So eight, three, and seven generally put into that box. And there we say that this is a social stance where I... I'm kind of focused on thinking about what I want and doing stuff to get it, yeah? So I'm not waiting for anyone. I'm really connected to what I want, what I desire, and I'm, I'm willing to push forward to gain this, yeah? Now, if we bring this into Karen and Horne's work, we might say that some of that would be an association with the Freudian concept of the ego, yeah? The ego, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the ways in which the Freudian theory is applied here, but just pulling it fully through because um, Hune was a, a psycho, you know, coming from, from that tradition in uh, specifically. So part of what, what we then say is if I'm a three, seven or eight, to assert myself is second nature. To assert myself is second nature. It's just what I do. So part of what the work is that we can work with our clients that are very strong in the assertive or expansive um, Hornevian is to help them be aware of other people and how they're affecting them. So very basic stuff. So if I'm thinking about my needs and I'm connected to them and I'm pushing in the world how to get them, then maybe it's useful for me to consider how that push is affecting others. Very basic. The other part um, is that it might be useful for us to slow down our three, sevens, eights to create opportunities to deepen um, and make relationships more meaningful. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm just pushing ahead, maybe others can't keep up with me. Maybe we're running at a speed where it's really hard to deeply drop in. Now, immediately you'll start seeing when we're talking about these kinds of things that the vertical development axis definitely has a massive impact on how true some of these patterns will be for us. But let's just talk about the average 378 at conventional 
early stages of development, so up to about performing, a lot of these things will be fairly true fairly frequently. One, two, and six, known as our compliance. Um, and here, the association from a Freudian perspective is perhaps more on the superego and the internalized voice of society or societal expectations. So here, um, there's this way in which what I want somehow is deeply infused by what society's expectations are in some way. And um, here we say the, the move is where the assertive is sometimes called the move against. Here we're talking about the move with others. So I'm kind of focusing on my communities around me and trying to act in accordance with that. So there's some form of compliance. I don't want to challenge too much. So two, I want to go with others' needs. Um, one, I want to go with what's proper or what's responsible. And Enneagram six, I may want to go with um, my duty or go with the norm in some kind of way. If we want to work with one, two, six from a Hornevian social stance perspective, part of what's useful work is to separate out what my desires are from the desires that I've internalized that actually come from others. So what are the things that I think I want, but actually I might not really want them. I've just kind of imported them into me um, through the mechanism of the superego. And to really, really stand still on how much influence am I taking into me from my communities of belonging? And how is that impacting on how I do things? Now, there's nothing wrong with taking influence. In fact, it is part of what helps us survive and navigate society. But how much of my own needs are being merged through that process? Um, just an example around that. I've worked with so many Enneagram 6 leaders who get into a space where they um, are almost paralyzed by the amount of advice that they're taking in when they're facing big decisions. It's like, it's like almost as though I'm formalizing management by committee around me and I've got a coach and I've got a mentor and then I've got a legal input and then I've got my board's input and then I've, there's so many um, inputs that I'm trying to take on board that um, I get a bit lost in there. Uh, if we juxtapose that for a moment, I'm working at the moment with a CEO of um, a startup biotech firm. He's an Enneagram 8, so he sits in the expansive, aggressive space. And his biggest challenge that he brings to his peers uh, for, for uh, peer coaching is how do I not strangle all the people with vested interests in my business that are trying to tell me how to run my company? Um, so that's almost the opposite kind of problem. I have, I have shareholders, they trying to tell me what to do. I really don't like what they're telling me. How can I nicely ignore them or tell them to bugger off because they're getting in the way of my expansive, aggressive social stance. The last group, the withdrawn, also called by uh, Karen Horne, the detached neuroses. And these are um, the types where I move away from people. Uh, and it's almost as though I'm going into my subconscious as a way of having my needs met. So my social stance is internalized through thinking and feeling. And there's quite a lot of thoughts around these types, nine, four, and five, sometimes really struggling to be in the body. Um, there's a question, can we say that this is in connection, you know, this is a, a, an elevation of the Freudian id in some ways, who knows, but one of the things that Freud said was that thinkers and poets are most, in, most connected to their subconscious, so maybe there's something around that going on there as well. Um, so there's a highly imaginative, inter, it's almost like I can imagine myself into having my needs met. Um, it's not necessarily by going out into the world. Now, when I'm working with nine, fours, and fives, 
part of what we need to support our clients to do or do ourselves is to move from imagination into reality and moving into the world as it is really out there. Um, so part of what 945s can sometimes do is they, they really spend a lot of time becoming absolutely brilliant at things, but those skills and talents aren't quite visible in the world. I know it's some of the work that I've done over the years is to say, who, why are you waiting to be discovered in some kind of way? You know, so here an assertive stance might be useful to move out into the world, to share skills and talents more. And also to come out of fantasy and into reality. So those are some of the core ways in which the Hornevians might be useful. Now, the first thing that I want to say in relation to this is I don't think that any of these things are as simple as just going with your main type. This is where the tri-types or the tri-fixes really help us kind of layer what's going on as a social stance. So if we, for example, take someone where my head center is seven, my gut center is eight, my um, heart center is three, so eight, three, seven, it's uh, all of those kind of mirror your assertive uh, Hornevian group. That's going to push that tendency towards assertiveness into almost triple drive, yeah? Whereas if I'm working with someone where my gut center is nine, my heart center is two, and my thinking center is seven, so nine to seven, here I've got one of the withdrawn, one of the compliant, <laughs> and one of the assertive types. And so there's this thing that might be happening inside me where I'm, I'm almost trying to assert but not upset and at the same time, you know, keep to myself some of the, the, the energies that I have. And so that's a lot more of a complex um, way of layering it. I know one of the lenses I use to, to look at the tri-types is always to check if there's like a, one of these triads, whether it's Hornevians, harmonics, object relations, that's fully intact in there. So with 837, we have the entire assertive tri-type. And so it is going to give that to us in spades. Whereas if it's a more complex mix, then maybe it's not going to be um, as strongly represented behaviorally, but you might hear some of the, the kind of inner battles between the the id, the ego, and the superego, if we use Freudian terms more clearly when you're coaching your clients. So I'll just pause it there for a moment, and I'll check. Any questions, any comments, any applications to your own tri-type, any ways in which the Hornevians have been useful or useless um, in your coaching? Remember where we started today, hold it all lightly. It's just theory, but yeah. Um, any comments or questions you want to pop in here? I can chip in a bit there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ings. I find it really, really helpful working with these. I mean, all the triads, but particularly what you were just saying is to talk someone through the report and say in each center what their dominant type is. And they really get it. If you say, oh, triple assertive, triple compliance, or, you know, and I'm sure you find that as well is that becomes a really powerful departure point for a conversation. And then look at uh, what goes missing in each of those um, triads. So that's later when the scrambling stuff comes in. So in seven, eight, and three, in all of them, they lose the feeling center. Yeah. So you know, just layering these different triads and, and the way the theory feeds in, I find incredibly helpful. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think another way in which one can really have the, the Hornevians like ping as potentially useful is when your coaching client is coming to you with challenges that relate to having their needs met or the response to the approach they're taking to having their needs met. So 
Um, and that might not be the language that they're using. But if it's like I'm really struggling to, you know, influence these stakeholders, you know, that's, a, that, that's code for I'm struggling to have my needs met. And therefore, the social stance I'm taking in relation to that can be very useful. Um, there's a couple of people here who either work in government or consult into government quite a lot. Um, and here's another way in which you can think about, and maybe it's true of all organizational systems, but if, if I'm working in a very bureaucratic system, as many government departments all over the world tend to be, there is a, almost a built-in mechanism inside the bureaucracy that pushes for a more going with stance, a compliance stance. Um, whether that's through policy application or not challenging the hierarchy too much, you know, there's, there's some push inside bureaucratic design that particularly pushes a compliant design. Now, if I'm working with a triple assertive inside a system that is built for compliance, um, it's really useful to understand the ways in which that going against energy um, inside a system that doesn't like going against energy might create certain patterns. And to help me navigate and see those patterns more clearly can definitely make for a much smoother ride. Um, we definitely don't want to lose all of our withdrawns or all of our assertives inside those bureaucracies because that would not be great <laughs> at all for getting things done in government. Uh, but it is one way to think about it. Often the withdrawns can navigate. So if I have a triple withdrawn, as an example, I can navigate the bureaucracy a bit better because I can just kind of pull into myself and live in fantasy and ignore it for, for an extended period of time. Um, the assertives often bash against uh, that, that bureaucracy a lot more. Any other questions or inputs? As if not, we are going to play with one of our first case studies. Um, and I'll just jump ahead to one of these. Let's I'm just trying to find one that will give us some patterning here. OK, so we'll work with this one. Um, so here we have a client profile. The main style of this client is Enneagram 4. Their try fix is 4, 5, 8. Um, and so if you just look at some of the theories, the Hornevian theory around the social stance, around having needs met, just note, are any of the social stance triads really low in this profile? And let's get a couple of people to just unmute and share. What do you see in this profile? How can you apply the Hornevian theory to what's going on here? What might you expect without trying to have a crystal ball into a client's life? Okay. So just checking, I'm going to invite anyone in the group that wants to be courageous to just say what you see. Oh. You can't get it wrong here at supervision people. <laughs> I'll jump in, Lucille. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, so at, at first blush, what I see is um, with the five and the four, the, their tendency could be to be more withdrawn. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting, they have the eight, which could bring uh, an assertive capacity in certain situations. I'd be curious to look for when they're able to access that assertive part of themselves. 
versus I would imagine their more primary default would be to, to be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And perhaps because of that combination, the way they show up assertively might be um, different than if they had a different combination of withdrawn and assertive because of mm. those three types. And the, the element that would be less accessible is, is, um, is compliant because mm. none of their tri-types are in the compliant area. Yeah, beautiful. So there's a, there's a great reading. So one, two, and six are very low. So the compliant, the moving with is definitely fairly absent here. And then you have that strong withdrawn with a strong assertive. Now let's layer a couple of other things we know into this. Um, so the one thing we can look at is the instinct. So the instincts bar, most of you are familiar here at the bottom. This is someone with a dominant sexual instinct. Yeah, so the sex, what do we know about sexual fours? They are often known as the more aggressive Enneagram fours. Um, and so here there is this interesting tendency to both withdraw into feeling things and maybe withdraw from directly having my needs met, but then at the same time, maybe with Enneagram 8, punishing people for not meeting my needs. So that would be one way in which one can bring in some of that potential contact content. Uh, one of the other things that we get with this kind of profile is someone who maybe vacillates. So at times not very visible in the system. So move away from systems and then at times coming in very strongly and demanding that systems meet the needs. Yeah, so I'm separate and then full in and then separate out and full in. So is there some kind of confusion caused in systems because of that vacillation in behavior? Might be something else to think about. Anyone else with a, a thought or a question based just on that profile? Just a little play. I would kind of summarize that type as a very critical outsider. So mm. there's the outsiderness of the four and the five, but with the challenging energy fueled by the sexual eight. So there's quite a disruptive, critical engagement with the system. Yeah. Yeah. So an anti-system, anti-system participation. I mean, we know five in and of itself can at times be a little bit um. I don't know, maybe anarchist is very strong words, but you've got the rebelliousness of the eight and the four with the kind of anti-societal stance that come, can come from the five. So there can be a somewhat antisocial perspective in, in that as well. And all of it is just conjecture. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Anyone else says that sees anything in there? Okay, so we are going to do a short breakout in, um, I think we can do pairs, yes. And what I'd like to invite you to do in pairs is to talk about your own trifix in relation to the Hornevians. What does this mean for me as a coach or as a practitioner, my own Hornevian? Yeah, what can I take from that? And... Um, yeah, let me just set up the breakouts. I'll pause the recording. Welcome back in the main room, everyone. Um, anything interesting that came up in that conversation that you'd like to share with the bigger group? Any interesting musings? or insights. Feel free to just chip in if there's anything that's come up. We are very quiet today. I'm wondering what that is about. What is that social stance? How are we having our <laughs> needs met right now? Um, and what's going on inside us? Is the super ego speaking? Is the ego speaking? Are we off in fantasy land with our ids? 
<laughs> Who knows? Um, I'll, oh, oh, not go, Andrea. <laughs> um, it's just a very interesting angle to look at your own Hornevians as a coach. I mean, mm. I don't know why I have touched on it before, but to even just think of one person I'm coaching who's um, a 136 and how what I might lead with or what I, you know I might come from as a 947 it's just quite yeah incredible to even just ponder on that and to notice it now going forward so thanks yeah beautiful Trish Todd I think both of you wanted to say something too um I think I had a sudden realization and that is that I've got a double withdrawn and a compliant and it was interesting because when you spoke about the withdrawal and you spoke about sort of living in my head mm -hmm. and realizing that even from a coach and facilitation point of view, I've never felt that I know enough about the Enneagram to be able to bring it fully into my work. So I'm constantly got the Enneagram floating around in my head and I'm thinking if I just do another workshop, go to another supervision, read another book, then I'll be able to use it more impactfully in my coaching. But actually, mm -hmm. I just need to jump right in there and just use it because it's, the, it's, I mean, it just explained exactly, you know, what yeah. am I waiting for? <laughs> Absolutely. So access a little bit of that assertive style and just take it out there and That's see what happens. It. Yeah. Absolutely, Trish. And you've definitely been reading books and going to courses um, uh, for long enough now. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's about time. Come on. <laughs> There, invitation to self-accepted. Todd, anything you wanted to pop in as well? Yeah, we had we had some good fun in our group because Christo and I are the same tri-type, but in a different order. Yeah. So it was interesting to see what might be similar and and that Nicola was our emotional support person uh, as a third in the group, which was helpful. So um, you know, to see, you know, for me, seven, nine, four social to kind of feel some, some of, it's almost like, feels like back and forth sometimes between really assertive and withdrawn, mm -hmm. it's almost like going back and forth for me, which was an interesting reveal. Mm. But leading from the assertive in your case, whereas Christy leads from one of the withdrawns. Mm -hmm. And Christy, is your assertive last in line? No, it's 974. 974, but, uh, okay, so. But, but, but I'm definitely, um, more withdrawn than assertive mm. Mm. Uh, in general. You see, assertive comes out at certain points, um, yeah. but but uh, the more constant pattern is 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 the withdrawn and and <laughs> the living in the the living in the unconscious, subconscious, unconscious. Um, <laughs> Depends on whether it's the healthy or the unhealthy sides of your withdrawn, whether it's the unconscious or the subconscious, maybe. <laughs> the unconscious is probably better. <laughs> whether it's Jungian or not Jungian. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else that would like to pop in there? Lila. <laughs> I am, by the way, wondering how many 974s there are on this call because it's a lot. Quickly, raise your hands if your tri-type is 97 and 4 in. Andrea, Christy, Ingrid, Todd, Adam, Lila. Lila. Oh, my word. Yes, we are surrounded <laughs> by you. Um, I, I just want to say I'm a 947 like Andrea. And it's hmm. so interesting how to, what Todd and Christy are saying. Uh, yeah. And even when you did the case study, because I'm like, I can really identify with that, that very strong assertive coming out. And I was telling um, Hugh about this, that uh, it's especially when there's unfairness or injustice or something, it's like just, it's quite strong. It's like bubbling under the surface. Um, yeah, I, um, it's such a different way of looking at the tri tap and I, I really appreciate so that I've got nine for seven, the two were drawn and the um the seven and assertive. The one, seven is assertive, yeah. Uh living in my head, I I do do that too, yeah. I'm, I'm forever presenting and a lot of these things. Whether I actually do it is another story. <laughs> yeah. 
So I just want to share that. But Beautiful. thanks you for. Thanks. Thanks so much. So let's spend a little bit of time on the other very interesting um, triad, the, the harmonics that we can look at. But here we're going to look at them in a different way. We're going to build the theory from the ground up. Yeah. So those of you that know the theory of the harmonics, well, just let it, let it go for a moment and think about the real people, yourself, your clients, as we work with these questions. So um, the harmonics um, have to do with how we are in times of change and conflict in some way would be one way of looking at it. Now, um, I'm going to not talk about the Enneagram for a moment. I'm going to talk about something from organization development theory, which is something that's sometimes called the Dana Miller Gleicher, sometimes I think the Beckert formula for change, the Harrison formula for change, it has many people have had their fingers in this pie. And this formula for change says that change happens when the product of dissatisfaction with what's happening at the moment and a clear vision of what's possible in the future and some practical first steps are all bigger than the resistance to change or the pain or the cost of change. Now, this is a wonderful formula. We can play games with this in our minds. We're not going to take that too far. But the way in which I always hold this is to say that dissatisfaction with the current state is, a, is something that, that helps me tune into burning platforms. Yeah? What's not working? What's not good? What's not right? Uh, at a given point in time. Yeah. So that's my burning platform is this dissatisfaction. It's not right. Something has to change. It's, it's taking that energy into myself. Once I've done that, it's also useful. Well, it's, it's great to be on a burning platform, but, but if it doesn't seem like a better idea to jump off the platform into the water below, I'm going to burn up on that platform. So I need to have some idea that there's a way out of this, that there's something else that can save me. So a vision of a possible future that's different from this burning platform. And then, of course, once I've got, this isn't working, this might be the future state, current state, future state, I need to have my first steps to take towards that. Now, if any of those values are zero, resistance wins. That would be the theory. If you just think about this roughly and mathematically. So if I only have a vision for the future and I don't have any dissatisfaction with the current state, am I going to change? No, because it's comfortable in my comfort zone. There's no burning platform. Yeah, so that, that would be one example of looking at this. Now, my question to you, and you can maybe use the chat box for this. Let's see if we can pull all of these 947s in the group into some conversation in another form. Um, the first question, so I only answer my first question right now. Which Enneagram styles are generally very good at saying something's not right? There's a burning platform. Or making us feel dissatisfaction with the current state more or feel it quite acutely. So just think about leaders you've worked with, people you've coached, team coaching, even yourself, which types are really good at saying, hey, something's wrong. Just pop that in the chat box. Or if you want to talk about it, you can unmute and chat about it too. Who are the canaries in the coal mine might be another way of saying that. Okay, great. So Sharon saying 378, really good at saying. Yeah, six. There we go. Six, eight, sixes, fours. Okay, so we've got some thoughts coming in there. Now, in my experience, those that often lead in that space, the eights definitely. The eights have no problem saying, hey, 
this sucks, this is broken, we have to do something about it, yeah? Or this isn't right, or there's an injustice, or that didn't work. My struggle to receive some of that information if, if they are the burning platform, but they're good at pointing out burning platforms. Um, I know a lot of Enneagram 4s get into trouble in systems for naming elephants. Let's talk about the discomfort. Let's talk about the unconscious bias that just played out there. So it's often a particular process-based, um, and I'm, I'm using this more, I'm not using this in a bureaucratic term, process, but process psychology base. The Enneagram 4s are good at calling those things out. And our 6s are often called the breaks in the organization, saying, here's the risk. That won't work. That won't work. Why are we doing this? So definitely that. Um, and some other types may also do that. I do think sometimes Enneagram 3s can say, 7s can say, 9s can say, all of that. But if, if we look at that, our 8, 4, and 6 are our canaries in the coal mine a lot of the time. Now, second question, once again, use your chat boxes. Which Enneagram styles are very good at imagining a beautiful, utopic future? So 846 is current state equals dystopia. Here we're asking the question, who are the ones that can dream up a wonderful future? We've got some quick votes on the sevens and some exclamation marks with that too. So yes, our sevens are telling us what's possible. Sharon, interesting there. Ones, definitely. Ones can sometimes do that. They can be very um, idealistic around how it's supposed to be. Definitely. I see where that's coming from. Eights can have a strong vision as well. Ingrid has some ideas around seven, nine, and four. There's more nine coming through. Yeah. Twos can also have that. So in terms of the envision, envisioning the future state, um, a lot of the sevens and nines have come through and then with some other votes. We can, we can look at that later. Last question. Which types that you've coached are very practical? They go, next step, next step, next step. Here is the project plan. Here are the ways in which we make these dreams a reality. Who are our translators into the project plan? <laughs> I love what Ingrid's type. There's lots of one and lots of three in that. We've got some one, three boats coming in. Okay, so we're starting to see how this works. Um, and obviously, once again, we're going to work inside the harmonics with um, the tri-types or the tri-fixes again, because I do think that's where some of the subtleties come in. But the general theory around this says that four, six, and eights are known as and this is a very, I mean, this is a funny word that you'll get in the Enneagram theory, reactive types. Ingrid, what's the word you use for the 468? I like that word much more. Um, emotional realness, is that, uh, is that the words you use for it? Yeah, Russ Hudson decided to change it to emotional real uh, from reactive because he thought the emotional reactive label was not on a par in terms of uh, being judgmental. Okay, great. So that's, Russ has changed that language. So some of the older books won't have that. Um, so emotional realness. So that's the part that goes, this is a burning platform. Hello, wake up. <laughs> um, inside myself or more in a group as well. 792 are generally known as the positive outlook type. So these are the types that go, it'll be better tomorrow, or here is the vision of how it can be better, or let's not rock the boat too much. But it's sometimes, it, um, I think there's another word. I'm out of words today, um, but there was something that has to do with avoidant, but a, another word that starts with an E, which I can't remember, that's sometimes used here. So 792 is like the Pollyanna side of the harmonics. And then 135, I also don't like the competency word because it assumes like others are incompetent in some way, but it's more of the practical solutioning types. 
that says, okay, first step, second steps. Now, the interesting thing, if we look at the harmonics through the lens of something like change theory, what we see is that in actual fact to get change, we need emotional realness, we need the positive outlook, and we need some of the competency element to actually overcome resistance to change, yeah? But what happens for us as individuals is maybe we have a lot of reactive emotional realness energy, but we struggle to define the future state or we struggle to get out of the burning platforms emotions and say, okay, what's the next step that I'm going to take? Um, so one of the ways in we can, which we can look at this is once again, do we have triples? If my trifex is four, six, eight or seven, nine, two or one, three, five, I'm triple practical solutioning triple emotional realness or triple positive outlook. Um, but what if, if I'm working with a client around affecting actual change <coughs> or resolving conflict that's out there, I possibly need all three. And so I can bring more balance into it if there are some places in which I don't have that. So what I've included in the pack for you is some of the um, some of the theory around this, so reactive, the uh, patterns of emotional reactivity under stress, work themselves up when a problem happens, have a hard time containing their feelings, uh, lots of emotional intensity, the positive outlook. This is more where we generally optimistic, we might avoid negative thoughts or situations, minimize problems, distract ourselves from that with something else, wanting to have everyone happy, so we're not going to go into what's wrong too much. And then the competence side, which is um, trying to solve problems in a more detached, objective way. Let's put feelings aside that one, three, five, or the competency harmonic can say. Let's put feelings aside. What are we going to do practically? Um, and it, it, it can sometimes be very frustrating for some of the other types to not have Emotions in play, and likewise, it might be very frustrating uh, for the competency types that emotions are in play from the emotional realness side. So those are some of the ways in which we can look at this. What I find more interesting is, so how do we work with it? So the first is that our awareness of how our patterns might work through the trifix helps me to strengthen the inner observer. Yeah, so I can, I can look at how it's working for the client. We can talk about it. If I can see that myself as, as the person being coached, my inner observer becomes stronger. Then, of course, we can, in the moment, hold up the mirror and ask, so how's this working for you? So great, this is our third session that we're talking about how the rest of the group are not rational enough and keep diverting the, the problem solving situation by doing this, this, and this. How's this working for you? Might it be useful for you to go into some of these other spaces to unblock some of the energy that's, that's uh, required in the team space? That might be a way of working with it. Um, I like this idea, and this is the, the OD practitioner in me to say, when I'm working with a team or in a client system, that's trying to affect change or that's stuck in a conflict to try and say, okay, so what's needed here? Is emotional realness required? Because we need to up the heat because this, this change is not coming through. Um, and how can you channel some 846 even though that might not be part of your trifix at all? Or similarly, we need some optimism or we need to for the time being, not deal with this problem because it's not right timing. How can you channel 972? Because this is what the system needs. So it's kind of elevating in the mountain, getting onto the balcony and seeing what the system needs as a way of enabling me to channel that as a leader into the system. Um, I've worked very effectively with clients where we're changing seats. So this works where we have for example, two people, maybe both of them are present in the coaching, or maybe one is bringing the other's perspective into the coaching. 
Um, so recently worked with someone where going through some, some challenges, the Enne it's an Enneagram 4 7 pairing. And the Enneagram 7 is like obsessively stuck in the loop of saying everything's going to be okay. It's hard right now. Things really suck. Things feel very tough, but don't worry, it'll be okay. Don't worry, it will be okay. And the Enneagram 4 kept on saying it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. <laughs> Can't you see how not okay this is? And so what happened in that conversation, they were both present, is to say, okay, from a harmonics perspective, we have positive outlook and emotional realness competing with each other. What happens when you both swap around? If you allow the Enneagram 4 to take some of the seven positioning and actually say what is great and what's still okay and what's still working, and for the Enneagram 7 to deliberately take some of the burning platform positioning here. And both of them felt super relieved. And there's actually quite a breakthrough that then enabled them to talk about what do we need to do next? Because they could both say, oh, I don't have to keep convincing you that it's going to be okay. Or conversely, I don't have to keep convincing you that it's not okay. <laughs> so swapping seats with another person. And then, of course, if we're swapping seats, then taking the third missing perspective. So we, neither of us are channeling a lot of the next steps, or the competency detached position. How can we both go meet in there, in that third perspective, and see what is enabled for us then? I'm going to just stop the share there. I know there are many of you that work with the harmonics quite extensively. So... Um, any additional thoughts or contributions around how the harmonics can be useful? What you've seen work in terms of bringing this to clients? Ingrid? So I like to get a real business problem mm -hmm. and then group them into their um, harmonics and get them to work separately to talk about their thinking, their first steps, that kind of thing. And then if they present back to the main forum, you can see very clearly the differences. But uh, it gets a little bit more tricky if you've got, say, uh, three, seven, nine, because then they've yes. got two positive outlooks. But generally, um, it does play out, and it's very interesting. Mm. That's a lovely practical way in which one can bring some of that energy. Um, when you do that, do you mostly work with the main type in terms of your organizing principle rather than the whole tri trifix? Yeah. Perfect. Anyone else with some input? Sarah? So, Lucille, I come at it from a slightly different view. I, um, obviously working with more individual base, I will take the presenting problem mm -hmm. and rather try and type the presenting problem. So is the presenting problem, um, positive outlook, um, competency issue, or emotional realism, and, and ask what keeps that in place? So, so as a problem, is the problem that we're looking at positive outlook, you know, that you know, this problem will go away, or, and then rather, yeah, leaving it in the problem rather than bringing the person to it. And doing what you do then in terms of what is the problem if we were going to type it, what holds the problem in place if we were going to type that, and then what is left as the third aspect to untie the two, mm. if that oh, makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, and it's a very interesting way of working. Um, I don't know if, if I'm putting you on the spot, but can you give us an example of, uh, of content inside that principle just, just to think that through together? Um, okay, it's going to be a little bit more therapeutic than it will be. Uh, coaching. That's okay. That's um, okay. We'll we'll understand it. You don't have to translate into coaching. But let's. So let's... so a client presenting the problem of my partner would like um, to get divorced, um, and I am thrown into an identity issue around what they're seeing me as, and I don't understand how they can see me in this way, my perception. And mm. so that really that part of their problem going into a very emotional realism space of really digging deep. Um, the partner 
presenting it um, kind of going, well, you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't do the other. So you're not being competent in this mm -hmm. marriage. And then going, okay, so what is the shared vision? You know, how, how could you have a vision where it's not about you being bad and it's not about you having to be competent, but what is, what is it that ties you together initially? So bringing in the positive outlook in terms of what is the shared vision and the shared goal mm -hmm. if they were choosing not to get divorced ultimately. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks. That's so useful. I've, yeah, I, I love that perspective. Really appreciate it. Anyone else who has a way of working with the harmonics that you want to bring in here? I think one of, one of the ways in which it's really useful to think about the harmonics is in a team context. And if I have an Enneagram seven leader in a team that has lots of ones and threes, often you get to the crux of both the gift and the frustration uh, of that leadership style in the team. So the Enneagram seven is constantly saying, here's the next wonderful project that we're going to take on that's going to make our function, our department, our part of the organization much better. And it's going to be great. And the ones and threes go, oh, here's another harebrained idea that we have to translate. And then you're going to move on to another idea before we finished it. Um, and so there we have a, a kind of patterning that plays out. And so for the seven leader in coaching to work with what, what do I need to do to be more in step with the one three side and for the group as a whole to say so. How do we break this pattern? Maybe we break the pattern through emotional realness. Maybe we haven't confronted this problem ever. We all just mumble and grumble about here we go again, but we've never really landed inside. This is the pattern and this is how it's working for us. So let's have that conversation. So, so looking at the patterns inside teams and kind of singling out a little bit the leader's pattern inside that and seeing how the conversation happens as it would between partners. Yeah. Great, so once again, and maybe with this one, what is really useful to do is to take, uh, let's do this one in the main group, and then we're going to do a second case study just in small groups. Um, so we're back with our four, five, eight, and we're now looking at this through the lens of the harmonics. So let me maybe talk through some of what I see here. So the first thing that we see is four and eight are both in the emotional realness harmonic. So both of those might create a proneness to, uh, towards towards expressing what's not working, towards bringing emotion into the process. And then there's this five piece that goes and into competency. And so maybe more, let's detach from it and then just get busy with it. What's absent in this, there's very little of the positive outlook harmonic. So here we have a vacillation between big emotion and then detaching from the emotion and getting on with it. Um, and not much in terms of here's the better future that we're working towards. Now, um, you might consider, and doing so in a very conceptual way, because four or five um, have a lot of conceptual energy, eight also maybe quite big picture energy, but not so much in the little practical details that one and three would offer from the competency perspective. Um, anything anyone else sees from a harmonics perspective in this profile? Anything else that strikes you? Eight, four, or four, five, eight, trifix, sexual. Can you put the slide up again? Yes, uh, absolutely. What strikes you, Ingrid? Mm. 
anyone that wants to add anything here? Nicola. It probably sounds really obvious, but I just just clicked into place for me around using the wings and lines to take you into one of the other harmonics and homilians. So not just going to another Ennea style, but actually be, yes. be quite an interesting thing to think before seeing a person just around in preparation. What is the line that maybe we work with or what is the wing that that kind of... Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So if we take it into that profile, if we want to access the positive outlook, then a healthy relationship with Enneagram 2, mm. that line might be really helpful mm. to help us access that. Yeah. If we want to up the competency part, the healthy access to Enneagram 1 mm. is the line that you'd lean into. That's yeah. really lovely. Now, <laughs> yeah. No, I was just looking at the geometry of it. Um, just looking at these triangles hanging around and not all of them, but it, it, it is just interesting how, how those wings and lines, they just do cross, they just give you a mix. Yeah. Yeah. And we can just work with the line, you know, if we slide down the line of stress, the Enneagram two, that's everything is fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Slide down the line to eight. Everything's not fine. You know, so we can even see if we just use, the, the way in which the stress lines work, that like vacillation that happens uh, in different ways for the types, yeah. So, yeah, um, just as a slightly humorous part of the session, um, maybe some of you have figured this out and maybe that's part of the silence, but this is what my profile looks like at the moment. Um, so have fun with that. Thanks for all the, all the comments uh, earlier as well around how the Hornevians work inside this profile. So um, here is a second. I am very naughty, I know. Um, here is a second profile that I want you to look at. And I'm going to ask you to just take a screenshot or take a quick picture of this with your phone before we go into small groups. Um, because I'm going to ask you to ju just discuss what you see here and you can integrate both the social stance, the Hornevians and the harmonics into this profile for uh, 297, self praise 297. Um, so just go unpack this profile a little bit. Um, I'm giving you just 10 seconds to maybe take a photo, take a screenshot and pop it in a document for you, and then I'll pop you into breakouts for a short bit. What do you see in this profile from a harmonics and Hornevian perspective? Okay, so let's do breakout rooms. And we'll make them slightly bigger this time, so not everyone will necessarily have a chance to share. Um, but we'll just do this for roughly 10 minutes and then we'll end off. So the rooms are open. Welcome back. The rest of them are here in five seconds. Thanks. So welcome back in the big group. Hopefully the, um, Triple positive outlook hasn't sent you running for the hills, singing the sun will come out tomorrow, tomorrow everything will be all right. Um, spoken like a true four. Uh, uh, but yes, hopefully that was a meaningful conversation for you as well. Trying to flip between different triads is a really good skill that builds a kind of mental muscle that allows for balcony, balcony viewing um, of our clients and ourselves in many different ways. So as we finish off some very exciting news and just a little quick peek, um, some of you have been lined up as our beta testers for our uh, self-service platform. And because you are all here today, um, you are going to get 
a first peek at it. And those of you that have signed up as beta testers, you um, uh, now I have somehow managed to close it. No, here we go. You, um, those of you that are beta testers, you will be able to start testing from uh, after this supervision session. But for those of you that will only be getting the platform where you can administer your own tests, just two minutes of once you log into the portal, uh, you have uh, a view and you can go and look at your recent activity. This is a, a fake coach, there's, so there's not lots of clients in here. And you can see the profile that you've been working with today. You can see that in here. You can do interesting things with it. You can send reports directly from the system. You can uh, customize your templates that you use to do so for invites, for sending reports and with whatever instructions and they come automatically with your names at the bottom. You can check your balance and your use of how many units you've used. You can create teams and request team reports. And there's a really beautiful help functionality as well. And of course, you can add new clients and add new assessments, either individually or in bulk. And in the absence of my fantastic, brilliant develop, development team, Cole Gigas and Marlon Ford, we're very proud of what they have developed. Now, this will be available and in everyone's hands in the next two weeks, but our beta testers are going to just test drive it for themselves for now and give us some feedback. So thank you very much to those of you that have agreed to do that. Um, yeah, so that's where things are going. Uh, the 8th of March, we have Steve Biko and Entitlement with Julia. And maybe just in close out, we'll invite two or three final comments, anything that you take from today that you want to share with the broader group. So Maybe hearing from those of you that have been a little bit more quiet, anything you want to put into the pot for us. Hopefully you'll go back to some of your clients that you're working with at the moment and look at what's going on there with some fresh eyes. But let's hear, who'd like to check us out? I would say something, <coughs> Lucille. And Thanks, Anne. <laughs> you know, I was just saying to the group just now that I have a team tomorrow where the, um, the leader is an eight and she's she's a much more aware eight. She's doing her work. She's much more integrated than she was when I first met her some years ago. And the rest of the team is composed of sevens and ones. That's it. That's the team. And this is going to be such an interesting thing to do in preparation for tomorrow, whether I use it or not in the day, but just for myself, just to be looking at my own you know, look, using this as a lens for myself to be watching what's going on with the team and the conversation that goes on. So, yeah, it's really been fascinating. Mm, fabulous. Thanks so much, Anne. Uh, and then some additional fresh layers to see and unpack mm. what's going on there. One last comment. Anyone else that like to check us out? Okay, so then from my side, thank you very much for coming to Supervision. It was lovely to see all of you. Um, and yes, today is the special day of lots of twos in the um, date. So to all the Enneagram twos in this group, some special love and blessings coming your way as well. You are surrounded by the number today. So yes, thanks so much for being here. Have a beautiful day, morning, afternoon, evening, depending where in the world you are. See you again in two weeks' time.